Hello, hello, hello. It's me, Chelsea Payne, founder of Payne and Glory Incorporated and the administrator of this particular group, Payne in the Pews Mental Health and Ministry. And it's Tuesday, so you know what that means. It's Let's Talk About It Tuesday. That's right. Let's talk about it Tuesday. As you're joining on the call, let me know that you're on the on the broadcast rather. Let me know that you're here, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching the replay. I would love to hear from you. We love to see your comments. We love um, the feedback that you provide, and we're just excited that you are here with us. We glad we're glad that you join us each and every Tuesday night. Um, at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time for this Let's Talk About It Tuesday. And each week is a different topic that we that we discuss, that we that we look into, resources that are provided right here in this platform. This is a safe place for us to discuss and to, to learn and to grow. Um, and we are just here. Hello, Priscilla. We are here um, to inspire, to uplift, um, to encourage, to uh, bridge the gap. Um, which is the purpose of pain and abuse, mental health and ministry to bridge the gap, um, the divide uh, between mental health and uh, ministry to know that there, that you, you definitely can have faith, be a person of faith, be a person who loves God and, and who um, is a seeker of God, but yet still have a mental issue. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me for those, <clears throat> excuse me, that are joining in. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining in. We love that you are here. And so we are going to dive in. We're going to, I have here some some notes. If you see me looking off to the side, that's because I have some notes here um, right beside me because I don't want to forget um, anything. <coughs> speaking, <coughs> excuse me, speaking with me, get, get a little something here. Got my, here we go. Just kidding. Just want to get get that together. But before speaking of not wanting to forget, March the 10th, which is coming up in just two weeks. March the 10th, we will hold our first Pain and Abuse Mental Health and Ministry Chat and Chew of 2018. If you had the opportunity to be with us in December for the last one that we held, uh, the final one for 2017. You already know that this one is going to be just as, as dynamic. We're going to, we ended 2017 with such a dynamic, with, with a bang. So we're starting off 2018 here in this first quarter. We have them quarterly. Um, so this, this being, um, the, uh, the first, uh, end of the first, well, part of the first quarter of 2018, we will be having it at, on March the 10th. At 11 o'clock a.m. at the Cynical Coffee Shop located in downtown Austell. If you've not seen the flyer, if you've not seen the promotions, um, if you follow me on social media, you'll see it. Um, you also can go to the events page um, of Facebook and just type in mental health and ministry and you'll see it there. It's absolutely free to attend. We simply ask that you uh, patronize our host uh, menu, which would be great because they have some amazing um, goodies and treats there. So um, that won't be a hard, a hard task. And of course, we at Pain and Glory are always accepting your donations so that we can, can continue to hold uh, things for free. Um, the more that people give and make contributions to Pain and Glory, it allows us, it affords us the opportunity to give back and to be able to be a blessing to people who really want to come um, and be a part of something that is um, that is beneficial to them. So tonight we're going to dive in. We're going to be talking um, from the from the viewpoint of the vantage point um, of from the pulpit to the pews. From the pulpit to the pews, mental health and ministry. And we're going to give some resources and information and just kind of some ways to erode the stigma and to not only just erode the stigma, but um, kind of eliminate some of the ignorance. And I, I don't use ignorance in a, in a derogatory or in a demeaning way. Ignorance, simply put, is, a, is, is, not, is not having knowledge of something. 
not having a clear understanding, I'm not having knowledge of something. So I'm not, when I say to clear up the ignorance, I'm not saying that in a, in a disrespectful way, but there in ministry is a lot of ignorance um, as pertains to mental health. Unfor- I mean, not a, I was about to say unfortunate, but interestingly enough, it's not so much of a divide in the professional world and the mental health professional. Mental health professionals, by and large, kind of get it. They get that you need that spiritual life, and they get that you need the the professional help. It's it's not really difficult. In well, it's been my experience of the past four years doing um, this initiative, mental health and ministry. It's been my personal experience. It's not very hard to get mental health professionals to to buy into, to help, to give assistance, to you know, to understand that the two are not exclusive to one another, that faith and, and, and mental health healing can go together. But in the church, it's a little bit more challenging. Challenging. And I think it's because of such a misconception that didn't necessarily start in the church necessarily, but probably started in households. And because those households came to church, it just perpetuated. You know, grandmama, you know, grandmama just said, pray about it. Great grandmama and great granddaddies just said, just pray about it. That's the devil. Ain't nothing wrong with you. You're just special. These are things that I'm not making these 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 terms up, these phrases up. These are things that people have actually told me that they've heard in their lifetime. And probably you probably have heard that not it may not have been said to you, but you at some point have probably heard um, some of our elders say that. So because of that, we we as as a community of people have just gone to church for it all, which is I'm not saying that's a problem. Not saying that. Let me be clear, clear, clear on that. I'm not saying that that's a problem. You should go to to church. You should pray. You should utilize your faith. You should read your word. You should apply the word. Absolutely. The word the word also gives us to know that there is that having counsel is important. The Bible also tells us that Jesus himself was the great physician. So if he was a great one, that means there are good ones somewhere in there. Hello, Queen. Hello. Thank you so much. Hello, Monica. Hello. I'm so glad that you all are on. So if if Jesus himself was the great physician and wonderful counselor, why in the world would it be necessary for Jesus to be called wonderful counselor if there was no need for counseling? Why, why is, why is it in the word? Because we, we must apply the word. If we go, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to call ourselves believers, this whole platform is called pain in the pews. So there's no confusion that I'm talking about the church. It says mental health and ministry. I'm talking about the two combined. So if we indeed are going to call ourselves believers and believers of Christ and, and followers of the word, then did not the word say, that by his stripes we were healed and that he bore our iniquities. So in that was not mental health included. In explaining that that we need counsel, did that not include mental health? When Elisha was going through and told, told God himself, speaking to God, when he told God this is enough, and he went into a cave, pretty much like someone modern day would go off to into their home, into their bedroom and close himself off that is dealing with depression. There are instances, several instances in the Bible that talks about depression, but not a whole lot of times in the pulpit that it's talked about. There are many times in the Bible where mental health issues are discussed, not so much in the pulpit. Or if it's talked about in the pulpit, the end result is talked about. Because I gave the example just now of Elisha. We skip over to the part where he 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 threw, he, he passed down his mantle to Elisha. 
but not the part where he was going through and, and hid himself in a cave and an angel had to come and tell him, get up from here. Get up. You can't just keep sleeping. You just can't be get sleep in this dark cave. You got to get up. More than one time, this angel had to come to him and kind of tell him, you, you can't stay here. You need help. And that's exactly what God gave him. God gave him help. God didn't reprimand him, didn't tell him that he was not a leader, didn't tell him that this is not how a leader behaves. He didn't tell him that, you know, he wasn't praying to him enough. He didn't do that. God gave him help. The saying. If we, if we if we then are believers of Christ, we have to believe that in the in the totality of his holiness and understanding us from our minds to our physical bodies, that he is indeed in control and we can turn to him and the people he has placed on here on earth to get our help and healing. If in fact we are encouraged to go see our medical physicians, our primary care physicians, if we are indeed encouraged to go get our annual checkups, if we as ladies are encouraged to go get our annual exams, if we are encouraged to do breast exams, if we're uh, for the men to do prostate exams, if we are encouraged to go, like for me, who, who's visual impaired, who, who, you know, I'm encouraged to go and, and have my eyes checked. If we go to the dentist, if we, if we are, are encouraged to eat properly, um, to prevent diabetes and heart disease, and if you happen to have these issues and maladies physically, then you're encouraged to go to your doctor, take your medication, do what is ne necessary so that you can be, that you can still function. Because if you're a diabetic and you don't take that insulin, not going to be functioning properly. If you're a person who's dealing with heart disease and you're not taking the necessary steps to manage your heart health, you're not going to be functioning properly. So if, in fact, we are to take these same measures for our physical body, which we should, everything that I just stated, we should do. We absolutely should do. And, and we should encourage one another, one another to do just that. Go see your doctor. Take your medication. Same is true with mental health. Go see a therapist. Take your medication. Well, the medication makes me feel funny. That's why they have prescriptions. They can change them. They can adjust them. If you are taking medication for I'll use the same examples. If you're taking medication for um, for your heart and the, that medication gives you side effects that make you feel worse than what you're actually dealing with, you, you typically will go back to your doctor and say, I think this is a little too strong. Can you um, this is what I'm experiencing. Can you prescribe something else for me? And typically what happens? They prescribe something that is comparable to what you had to manage your symptoms, but still, but, but not give you the symptoms that you were exhibiting, that you're experiencing. Well, what about the same thing if you are taking medication for anxiety or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or, or depression and you take it and it makes you feel a certain way? Then that same psychologist that prescribed that medication, you can let them know, because everybody's different, you can let them know, this makes me feel too sleepy, or this makes me forgetful, or this makes me feel as if I'm out of my, out of my character. Let them know what you're experiencing, and certainly they will consider what you're, what you're describing and prescribe you something else. It is really not... If you look at it from the standpoint of your physical health and your mental health being in the same category, it's really not that difficult. But somehow along the way in church, especially in the African-American church, well, no, let me take that back. I can't say especially. I can't say that because I don't have a vantage point. I don't have a, a I don't have a range to, to determine whether it's happening in the in the only in African American church, in the black church, in the Hispanic church, in the Asian church, in the Catholic church, or in the in the, in the Jewish synagogue or in the Muslim mosque. I don't know. I can only speak from my experience. 
And my experience has been in the African-American church, you take it to the altar and leave it there. Yes, you should. But once you get up from there and you know that there's still something going on, be seen. And there are resources. There are resources available that are so willing to work with churches and ministries, organizations. I'm, I'm a witness. I am not a mental health professional. I'm not a church, but I am a nonprofit organization. And I have plenty of mental health professionals, not only mental health professionals, but advocates, organizations um, that are, are very willing and 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 very um, um, open to partnering with me from to to me sharing. I have referred um, people to various different um, practices and 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 um, clinicians, therapists, organizations, coaches, because they get it. They get it. There, there are two, two examples I want to share with you guys before I give you these um, resources. And this is, I mean, and the resources that I, that I have here, and I'm going to post them in a thread. The resources, I, resources that I have here don't even begin to scratch the surface, to be honest with you, because they're, these are larger organizations. However, there are numerous practices um, that are in your community. If you live anywhere, wherever you live, there, there's, there's um, aid for you, right? There are some that will come to your home. There are some that have group sessions. If you feel more comfortable in a group setting, there are some that, that will do, you know, the one-on-one, -on -one, obviously the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there are some that do, that have, uh, uh, physical activities for you to do because maybe you're not one to just sit um, in a chair or sit on a couch or whatever. Maybe you want to actually do something that 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 stimulates your mind and at, at, what, during your healing process, there are options out there. One thing that we've said many times, um, and, and that's been said actually quite a few times over the past couple of weeks, is people are suffering in silence. And there's really not a need to suffer in silence when there's so much help for us. But the problem is, number one, do we do we know how to access it? And the stigma associated with actually going after that help is is deafening. The silence is deafening. And the stigma associated with getting help is deafening. So let me give you two, two, two different people, two different situations, two different times I've met two different people. And usually I, I try to give you real life stuff. I, well, I always I don't just try. I give you real life experiences, real life things that real people have said to me or real experiences that I have had. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Priscilla, you make a very good point. So when I when I'm on here, I'm not giving hypotheticals. I am actually giving you actual accounts of things of conversations I have personally had, situations I've experienced myself or seen myself with my own eyes, or experiences people have shared with me. So a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe a couple of weeks ago, you all um, heard me give the um, the example of the young lady who. Um, had gone to church after having a mental health um, crisis um, and she had wanted to just go back to church. She just was looking forward to going back to church and, and um, she was, had the opportunity and she went back to church. And when she did, how they handled her was what changed a lot for her in the fact that they treated her, the person as a demon and they, they prayed P-R-A-Y-E-D, for her as if she were the problem. They prayed for her as if she was, there was something wrong for, with, with her, and all she wanted to do was come back to church, to the place that, that she found solace and she found comfort. She was just, 
She had been hospitalized. She had been medicated. She was taking her medication. She was doing what she should have been doing. But yet when, of course, news travels and she went back to church, had they been trained in what mental health is, really, and how to really minister to the person, mind, body, and spirit, if there had been something in place where they had talked to a mental health professional or a mental health advocate, if they had had something where they had people come in and maybe talk to the leaders or talk to the congregation, you know, um, not, not, I'm not saying specifically for that young lady. I'm just saying in general, in general, um, you know, have something where, and I'm, I'm going into the resources part as I'm giving these examples in case you guys didn't, didn't realize that. Have, you know, something in place where if this is not your area of expertise, if you don't understand, if you don't know what to do and, and your, 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 your role and your understanding is to pray, please pray, stay over here and pray or stay here, stay here, stay wherever. But then partner with organizations, uh, practices, mental health professionals that can come in and teach what you need to know. A lot of times churches hold um, seminars and workshops that, you know, they, they do the blood pressure and they do um, they do the health and wellness day. That's what I was trying to think of. A lot of churches do that now, which I think is awesome. Incorporate mental health in that. You know, there are so many hospitals, practices, counselors, social workers that are willing to take time out of their schedule so that they could come to your church, ministry, organization, or even even I, I, someone was saying the other day about uh, you know having a having having it a part of their family reunion. How how wonderful is that? How wonderful is that? And then someone called on the radio when I was on the radio last Saturday, and she was talking about in, incorporating talking more to her family about mental health, and and not she said she will not be quiet about it. There are ways to to incorporate getting understanding, eroding the the stigma, and getting understanding. Because what will happen is what I explained to you all last week about nuns, duns, and mental health, and nuns, duns, mental health in the, in the church. People are going to start leaving, and that's the sad part. We don't want people to leave the church. And when I say leave the church, I'm not talking about leaving that church. People are leaving church. Walking away, not from God, from church. Nuns, duns, nuns are, 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 if you didn't get a chance to, to watch last week, nuns are N-O-N-E-S, not Catholic nuns, but nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They are the ones who do not associate or affiliate with any religious group, organization, or denomination. Not atheist, not to be confused with atheists because they still believe in God. They still have faith. They just choose not to have any connection to the church. Duns are typically people who were raised in the church, who are typically ser- who have typically served in some capacity in church, um, but ha- are now done, done with church. And, and the standpoint I talked about last week is, and there are many factors. There, there, there are many factors for why people are done. Um, for for some, it is because they feel as though they they. Well, I'm not going to all of that because there's a list. But what I stuck with on last week were those who were done because of the example I gave just a moment ago about how their mental health state was not dealt with or understood. So they felt as though they were ostracized and that they were stigmatized. And so they left. Still love God and still holding on to the the faith that they do have, but done. We don't want people to be done. We want them to get help. We want that we don't want them to be done. We want them to feel as though they are supported and loved. 
And here's the thing about what I just said about the nuns and duns. Some of the a good number, not even some, a good number of the duns. And this is this is the research I did personally myself, uh, personally myself and people I have talked to, which has which really has blown me away. Well, I'll put it this way. When I first start hearing about it, blew me away. But now I've heard it so much. I'm 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 clear on it. And here's the thing. Here, here's what it is. A lot of the duns, pastors and ministers. I have met so many former ministers, so many former pastors. And the sad thing about it is there was an article, well, actually it was more than one, but one really good one that I read um, about pastors and why they were leaving the church and stepping, why they were stepping down from ministry, why they were stepping away from their calling while they were leaving the church, three different things. One of the top ones was stress. One of the top ones was feeling as though they were they weren't understood. Not to say that they weren't start studying the word, not to say they weren't called, not to say and I don't I can't speak on I don't I don't know. But what I do know is and and I ha- I hesitate to give numbers because numbers change, percentages change and I don't know who they were surveying in, in, you know, who, you know, was it a certain population of pastors and ministers? What, I don't know what region of the country they were, they were surveyed. So I hesitate to give numbers, but suffice it to say, it was quite a lot. It's quite a lot. Top of the list, stress, stress and anxiety. Stepping down from the pulpit, stepping away from what God called them to do. And let me tell you something. Let me be very clear about this. Just because you wear a collar, just because you've been called or placed or or appointed, because in some denominations you are appointed or in some churches you are you are elevated and appointed. You may not feel well, not getting that, but you're placed in position. But you're still human. So if you are a pastor, minister, elder, preacher, teacher, apostle, bishop, whoever. And you have all you have family history of mental health. You are predisposed through environment, chemical imbalance, PTSD that that for whatever reason. You're 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 do you think the enemy is just going to say, well, never mind. I'll not. I'll, I'll leave him alone. I'll leave her alone. Do you think that that mental illness is just going to say, you know what? I'm going to skip over them. No. Just as just as the examples I gave about taking care of your physical body, your heart health, your 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 physical health. I'm telling you, the mental I have this. This is this is a conversation I had with a pastor two years ago. This pastor told me that they would get up and preach on Sunday. Now, this is the conversation I had two years ago. And then a conversation I I was a part of. uh, November, December, just a few months ago. Okay, bear that in mind. Conversation I had with one pastor two years ago told me they would preach and teach the word of God on Sunday morning. Preach, God would move, the, the presence of God would come in, people, she would see people healed, see it before, see it. Go home, close the door to her bedroom, and curl up in a ball but, but because of anxiety and would not want to come out of her room. A few months ago, I was part of a conversation. And this bishop was talking and he was he was actually as answering questions. And he said that he counseled several pastors who said that they'll get up and preach on Sunday and on Monday they want to quit. And it's not because and he, the, the topic was about mental health. So he wasn't talking about because the offering was low 
or because he just didn't feel like getting up. The topic was about mental health and pastors and ministers. And this bishop said he's had to counsel other pastors on, on, the, on the mere fact that they were overwhelmed. So who helps the helper? They need as if, if, the, if the lead, if the head understands and can matriculate that information down to the body that it is okay to get help, imagine how comfortable people will be with coming into those four walls of wherever they serve at, how comfortable they'll be to be able to say, you know what, uh, my church has um, a list of, of, of resources that they provide for us, for us, you know, uh, business cards, a uh, pamphlet, something, mental health awareness, something to help, to help. Because quiet as is kept, the suicide rate is not going down. And the suicide attempts and the suicides that actually take place don't stop in the pews. They go all the way up to the pulpit. So we must be prayerful. We must be mindful. We must be educated and, 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 and get rid of the stigma that we can't get help. And your help may not look like my help. Your help may not look, you might not need what I need. I may need a therapist. You may need a, cow, a, a coach. I may need a psychiatrist. You might need a social worker. I might need medication. You might need meditation. I don't know. And you won't either until you take the steps to make yourself whole. And I am pressing buttons that I shouldn't be doing. That shouldn't have come up, but you got to take steps to make yourself whole. People, people's lives are depending on it. And when I say people's lives, I'm talking about yours. We are responsible for the vessel that we've been given. What we put in it as far as food and, and beverages, medications, all of that. We're responsible. So if, if, if that's the case, because this is the only one we're going to get. All of this is all we're going to get. We, there, there, is a, there, there isn't a clone that's coming. This is going to take over, you know, you know once, once this, this body <laughs> shuts down, it's, it's a wrap. Might as well take the best care of it, mind, body, and spirit. So here are some resources. And, again, I'll put these links um, in the thread so you guys will, will have it. There's, um, if you are in uh, the metropolitan Atlanta area, there's Wellstar. Wellstar has behavioral health um, system um, that's available. Nationally, not locally as well as nationally, there's NAMI, N-A-M-I dot org. Uh, which is a great, um, yes, yes, Val and, and, and Valerie, you know what, you, I, I noticed that you say, hey, tip, taking meds, there, there, are, there are other things, such as meditation, there, there are other things, so, and then it, it always pays to get the information that you need, and Google is not always it. <laughs> we, we actually have to physically go in and just see what works. So NAMI is a good resource. There's NAMI, the, the nationwide organization, NAMI.org. You can go on their website. Then there, there's local ones. So if you're not here in the metro Atlanta area because there's NAMI, NAMI Georgia, then if you want to narrow it down to, uh, I know there's a NAMI Cobb. So if you're not in Cobb County, I think that there are, um, different um, outreach, uh, different extensions um, all over Georgia. Then there's SAMHSA, S-A-M-H-S-A, -S which stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They have a plethora, use that in a sentence three times this week, children. <laughs> uh, they have a plethora of, of resources there that you can click on and get information and resources there. There's also mentalhealth.gov, mentalhealth.gov. There's NIMH, 
NIMH, which is the National Institute of Health. And that's, and that's NIMH.gov. And then there, I mean, literally, literally there, there's a lot. I myself and, and Queen, who's also on this thread today, um, we are part, um, of a uh, of an initiative, it's the faith based mental health initiative, where that is comprised of mental health professionals, advocates, um, those that are that are peer uh, representatives, um, just a, a whole great group of dynamic people. Um, yes, let me get back to what you just uh, said, um, Queen. Let me let me get that up on the screen so people can see. Um, you, um, Queen, who is a mental health professional, um, she says many psychotherapists use holistic approaches and various tools when working with clients. You definitely, if you're on this thread, you want to connect to M. Queen Bailey Brooks. I'm telling you, you want to connect to Queen because she, if, if, like you said, Valerie earlier about the meds, she has a whole, her, her, her whole approach is a holistic approach. So little plug there, but that's actually the name of her of her company, a holistic approach. So listen, uh, she's on this thread. If you have questions for her, connect with her. She is a dynamic mental health professional. And I was, I was as I was saying, she and I are on the same um, or part of the same organization or, or initiative called the Faith Based Mental Health Initiative. And it's I'm telling you, it's great. It is a great organization uh, or initiative that is comprised of a, a number of great dynamic people. And, and there are people within that group that I have referred many people to um, because there are therapists and mental health professionals as part of that group. So um, I like as I said, I'm going to post in this thread um, these resources um, and these resources are, are I mean, this is just scratching the surface. But if you are interested um, because as you know, this is not just a group. Pain and Abuse Mental Health and Ministry is not just a Facebook group. It is an, in an it's a full fledged initiative that I started four years ago um, under my nonprofit Pain Pain and Glory. And so, if you are interested, if you have a ministry, a church, or organization, um, or even you know you just want to have um, uh, a gathering with family and friends, and you would like for me to bring for us to bring. Pain and Abuse Mental Health and Ministry to you. And what that means is we will have mental health professionals that would provide in a, in a panel discussion or a Q&A session or however you want it structured. We would bring that to you or to your organization, your church. And so that we, we would we would actually have a seminar or workshop or however you want it you want it packaged, we will create something that fits just for you. So if that's of an interest for you, please contact me and let me know. Um, and I'll put our email address in the thread as well. It's info, I-N-F-O, at painandglory.com. That's info at painandglory.com. And we will be happy to bring pain and, pain and abuse mental health and ministry to you. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Listen, I want you guys to know that there are resources available. I know earlier I said I was going to give you two examples. I gave you the one of the young lady, but I think that I think that because of of what I was discussing about the pastors, I think that that actually it, it ties in better than the second example that I was going to give because ministry leaders need help too. And part of the conference that we're hosting this year, this year's Pain and Abuse Conference, is going to be September 21st and 22nd. And a component of that very conference this year is going to be pain in the pulpit. And we're going to we're going to have a special session just for pastors and ministry leaders, just for them, because who's helping the helper? Who's 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 giving them the help and support they need? I was talking to someone and he made a good point when someone in the church, you know, if they if, if a loved one passes away, you know, he or she loves that loved one just as much as anyone else. But who do they call first to do the eulogy? Who do they call first to be there for the family? But who's there for them? When something tragic happens, who's the first to get the phone call? When something is going on in the community, who's the first to get the phone call? It's usually the leader. 
understandably so because they're the leader, but after they've hung up the phone, after they perform the funeral, after they've done whatever it is they need to do to get the family or the individual back on track, who do they release to? Who do they talk to? Who do they go to in the natural, in a natural form, in human contact? Who do they go to? Something to think about. So listen, I thank you all for joining on this call. I'm so appreciative. On the, I keep saying call because uh, it's just going one way, but I appreciate you guys being on this broadcast. I appreciate you each and every week, every Tuesday. I'm excited that you're a part of it. Listen, you don't want to miss March the 10th. I told you a few moments ago about Queen uh, Bailey Brooks, but you don't want to miss this. She is going to be our guest speaker that's going to be with us for the mental health and ministry um, chat and chew that's going to take place on March 10th. Um, as I said, if you haven't seen it already, go to the events page right here um, in uh, uh, on Facebook. You'll see it. Type in mental health and ministry. It's March the 10th. Listen, if you have elders in your family, your loved ones, you want to be a part of this. 65 and older, if you have loved ones, family members, co-workers, anyone that is in a part of your family that that is 65 or older, you want to hear this. Let me tell you why. I'm, I'm just going to tell you one thing. Queen is going to blow you away, but I'm going to tell you one thing. A lot of things that we attribute to just getting older probably isn't. I'm just going to tell you. It probably isn't. But because we don't know how to relate and understand uh, uh, our elders or we've not been taught, we don't know to, what signs to look for, your elder actually could be experiencing late life depression and you not even know it. And you attribute it, you attribute it to them just getting older. It's not. It's probably not. It's likely not. You want to hear what Queen has to say. And then we're going to be talking about women's issues. Women, women, ladies, sisters, sisters, we need you there. You, we, we don't need you there. Honestly speaking, you want to be there. How about that? You want to be there. We're going to be, t be talking about the, the emotional well-being, um, the emotional and mental well-being of women. You want to be there. March the 10th at the Cynical, downtown uh, Austell, Georgia, Veterans Memorial Highway. You don't want to miss it. 11 o'clock. Absolutely, absolutely free to attend. We just ask that you support the host venue, which is not a hard thing to do because they have delicious and wonderful things there. It's a great place. And again, as I said at the, at the top of this broadcast, we certainly welcome your donations here at Pain and Glory so that we can continue to have things for free. It's because of your free will donations and gifts that we're able to have things for free. So continue to sow your seeds to us, and we are most appreciative. Trust me when I tell you that. We've got a lot of things coming up, and I don't want you to miss out on, on it because there are things that are designed especially and specifically, completely and wholly for you. So listen, I'm Chelsea Cookie Payne, founder of Pain and Glory Incorporated and the administrator of this particular group, Pain and Abuse Mental Health and Ministry. I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. But more than that, I look forward to seeing you on March the 10th for Mental Health and Ministry Chat and Chew. God bless you all and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week. I love you much.